So yesterday morning, uh, Jai and I both mentioned the Python modeling tool, or PyMT, which is uh, a product that we hope to roll out in its fully featured glorious form under Systems 3.0, but it actually exists now as a beta um, product. And we thought we'd tell you a little bit about it and, and how it works and show you a bit of a demo. And I, I, one way to tell you about what PyMT does is um, to share with you kind of a wish list of things that I wish I could have done in, when I was in grad school. Um, there are many things I wish I could have done in grad school, <laughs> actually, but this is a subset. Um, one is, it would have been cool in running models if it were possible to run a model in some kind of an interactive environment that has plotting and analysis capabilities built in. Something as sort of a MATLAB-y, IDLE kind of a thing. You run your model right there and then, so you've got all your data produced by your model right there. Um, and don't have to muck around with writing to a file and reading from a file and whatnot. That would have been good. Uh, it would have been nice to play with a model, actually, in that same mode, to be able to, let's say, run a model for a certain amount of time and then pause it and plot some output and uh, maybe change a parameter or inspect some values or actually change some state variables in the model. You know, maybe if it's a model of terrain, I want to suddenly dig a big hole. Say, what if I build a big mine here? Or what if you know, nature popped up a mountain here or something like that? Um, that, would have made, that would have made it a lot easier to do the kind of playful experimentation um, that often leads to new insights. For that matter, when it comes to coupling models, it would be nice if you could do that in an interactive environment as well. That if I could run model one for a little bit and then take its outputs and feed them into model two. Maybe it's a delta pile of sediment and I want to take that sediment and figure out the flexural isostatic response to the changing sediment load, right? That's one way to couple models. Um, maybe if I, that's a loose way of coupling. Maybe if I wanted to do tighter coupling, I could even query each model in my interactive environment for its derivatives and then take those and do a matrix inversion as a numerical solution, right? Because my interactive environment has matrix tools built into it. And then finally, it would have been cool if, uh, if there was some standardization among models. I think those of you who work with model codes find that they're often fairly idiosyncratic. Each model is a little bit different and you sort of have a new learning curve. But you know, I don't know how many of you rented cars who have come here from out of town, right? You sort of take it for granted that when you rent a car, it's got a steering wheel, a brake, an accelerator, and they're all in about the same place and they work about the same way, right? So it would have been nice if there was some standardization. After all, although models are very different depending on what they are, there are some common ingredients among them, right? You run them, <laughs> you initialize them, and so on. So as you guessed, these are some of the things that one can do with the Python modeling tool. And one of the things that makes that possible is the concept of a basic standard model interface, the so-called BMI. So let me tell you a few things about BMI, which you've heard of before. Some of you have worked with it before. Um, the basic model interface is a, is a standard definition that, that um, Systems has developed. Um, you can learn more about it. It's published in a paper by Scott Peckham and colleagues in 2013 in Computers and Geosciences. So thank you, Scott. Um, the BMI is, it's, the concept is fairly straightforward. It's the steering wheel, brake, and accelerator for a model. And it consists of a set of standardized functions, or subroutines in Fortran speak, that have standardized names, standardized lists of arguments that you give it, and standardized things that they return. And they do just a set of basic things, things that almost every model will do. It'll initialize a model. There's a function to advance a model in time, uh, a function to clean up, a function to interrogate values of some particular parameter or variable, and even functions to change those if you want to if you want to tweak it in mid-run. Right? There's a little bit more to it than that, and there's some devils in the details when it comes to actually applying it, but that's the essence of it, right? It's fairly straightforward. So the thing is, if if a model developer adds this set of functions to your code, um, then you can hand that code to the integration facility team and they will do a few more additional processing steps and the result will be your code will then be a component that can be run through the Python modeling tool 
or through the web modeling tool, as the case may be. Um, this will work for a model that is written in any of the CSTMS um, compatible languages, so C, C++, Fortran, Python, and Java. Okay, so Eric is gonna tell you a little bit about how that process works and then actually show you PyMT in action. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. Uh, is my mic working? Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna talk to you first about what happens when your model graduates from BMI school and, uh, and becomes fully BMI compliant. And so that's when you give it to us and then we'll take over and we'll do a few things. Uh, it's kind of hard to read with the, the ferns here. So the, so the first thing that we'll do, it will write a recipe that builds your, your model so that we can automatically build your model. And then we will deploy that to our repository so people can download a built version of the model. And we, <clears throat> excuse me, we test that every night. Uh, you may ask, Eric, I gave you a model, it works, why do you need to test it every night? Um, the reason is, uh, well, for one, maybe you will make a change to it, but then we, we check for all your dependencies. So you'll have lots of dependencies, or maybe few, but you'll have some dependencies. Maybe it's just a GCC version, but we wanna make sure that your model doesn't break when the dependency changes. So we'll do that for you. And we deliver it to the bakery, which is where the recipes are stored and the models are baked every morning and tested. And we do that every day, as I said. And then thing four is we babelize your component. So this allows it to talk in different languages or to communicate with other models in different languages. Primarily for PyMT, we're gonna just use the Python bindings, um, but we will babelize, um, the babelizer will work on, as Greg said, Java, Fortran, C, C++, Python. But BMI is language agnostic, so you can write BMIs for other languages, but that's just what the Babelizer works on. Um, we also have a BMI for, for instance, um, web APIs. So the, our WMT is based on a BMI for a web API, and we could communicate with that as well. And again, we test nightly um, on your Babelize version. And, but then today I'm gonna talk to you about uh, PyMT components. So we'll load your model into PyMT so that it can be run as a PyMT component. I, I just realized this this morning, thing one and thing two, they made a terrible mess of the house when the, the mother left. And so I shouldn't have put that in because we, we don't make a mess of your model. <laughs> Sorry. So I'm gonna run through some examples and I'm gonna try to do this live. Um, I get nervous enough when Mark is staring over my shoulder typing, so bear with me. Um, and a big thanks to Mariella for, uh, thanks to Mariella for convincing me to do this live. So we'll see how that goes. This is an experiment. Uh, so the, so I'm gonna do, go run through three examples that sort of run from one to the next. I'm gonna show you how to run a generic BMI model in PyMT. So hopefully we're gonna make it more accessible for people to run models and get models. I'm gonna actually run child, which is a landscape evolution model. And then I'm not gonna actually show you, or I'm gonna show you how to couple a landscape evolution model child with a seascape evolution model, Sedflex 3D. Um, it takes too long to run, so I can't show you it live, but I'll show you the code um, and hopefully convince you that it's not too difficult to do. All right, here we go. Okay, so. So everyone can see that, I hope. So this first line is you don't have to worry about, it's just help um, plotting so that I can show you some plots. So the first thing we're gonna do is just import a component from PyMT. So how many people are familiar with Python here? Okay, good. I wasn't gonna change the presentation if no one said they were. <laughs> I just, it's, just, it's just good to know. No. Uh, so from, so from pymt.components, uh, import, and then we're gonna import sedflex 3 d And for now, I'm just gonna rename it to be model. I wouldn't normally do this, but you'll see why. 
a little later. So now we will, uh, so I'll instantiate model. So now we have a Sidflex 3D model. Um, we could have more than one model, but for now we're just going to have one version of Sidflex. And we can get some help on, uh, on the model. So this is a doc string for Sidflex 3D. So we have a description of it, but I wanted to show you here a couple things. One, we wanna be very careful that we give credit where credit's due. So when you, know, I, I, when you give us your component, I don't want it to get lost in our framework. So when people use the framework uh, and they're using your component in our framework, I wanna make sure that they, they know that it's your component. So we list the author and we list uh, DOIs and we links to the source code. This is all open source. So we want you to, if you're using this model, we want you to be able to see the source. And then we also have a citation with the model and it could be more than one citation. So that you can, so if you do that, use this component in PyMT, this is what you would cite. And we're going to add, we don't have this yet into PyMT, but we will, where PyMT will keep track of all the components you use, and even maybe components you don't even know you're using. Um, maybe one component uses another one under the hood. Um, so that at the end of your simulation, you can say, PyMT, what are all the citations for the simulation that I ran? Um, then the other thing that we add in PyMT is the ability to change the input file parameters. So these are all parameters that you would change normally through an input file, which is very different in different models. Uh, but now we can change them as keywords uh, with dynamically within Python. So that we're going to, oh, I was going to do some cleanup just in case. Um, so first of all, we're going to, um, set up a model simulation. So we're going to get a config file, and we're going to get an initialization directory, and then we're going to set up setflux in a folder called underscore model. Now if we look inside model, now you see all the setflux input files have been placed in there with some default parameters. You could change the, the parameters from the defaults to the setup method, but for now, I'll show you how to do it with child. Um, so Sedflex has a bunch of complicated input files, there's six of them, but they're all set up for you now. So now we'll get to the uh, DMI methods that, uh, that Greg was talking about. Uh, so we're gonna, so this is it. Uh, so we're gonna initialize Sedflex in, so now Sedflux has read in all the input files, it's initialized itself, so now it's ready to run. And we'll just, just for fun, we'll run it for uh, just 10 times fast. So now it, this is the update method, so this will advance the model forward in time by one time step. And just to see that it's working, we're, or it's doing something, we'll uh, print, well, I get current time step, or current time. So now we've printed, so now we've run it to what looks to be uh, 10 years. And we can double check that those units are correct. So model dot. So yes, that, those were uh, days. We, have, we can have a little bit more fine grain control. You don't have to update it just one time step. We could do model dot update until a particular time. Um, let's do 20 years. So we could do 20 times 365 because said flux is in days, or we can just say we're going to specify the units of years. So now <clears throat> if we did, well, get time, we're at 7,300 years. We also give the ability to change the units in said flux because when you're coupling models, oftentimes the time units will be different. So I could reset if I wanted to, I could go back up here and reset the units to be years, which would match said flux. But I'm not gonna do that right now. Um, we can also get, now we've run it, and we wanna get some information from it. So we can query some output variables from said flux. So model dot, so now we get a list of the output variable names, and there's lots of them. And then we use, as Greg showed, the uh, get value function. 
And uh, let's look at seawater depth. So, we can, so in this case, you can see it was initialized to uh, water depths of 50 meters and on land it's 30 meters. And you can also, there's unit conversion. So if you want to change units, um, you could change the parsecs. I don't know why you would, but you could. So that's how you run a general BMI model in PyMT. So I hope that was pretty simple. And then I want to demonstrate that it's the same. You know how to run one. You know how to run them all. So let's add child. So now we're going to instantiate child. So now we'll get some help. So all the commands are going to be the same. So now we have child with a couple citations, the authors, versions, links to source code. So again, I'm going to do some cleanup. Now we're going to set up child, but I'm going to do it a little bit differently that, uh, this time, just to show you that you can um, change the input parameters from the defaults. So it's simple. So instead of editing the input files, you could just change uh, variables as keywords here. So we're going to change the node spacing. I think the default was probably a kilometer to now it's three quarters of a kilometer. Uh, the width of the domain in the x direction is. 20 kilometers. Uh, let's see. So I believe it's going to be 40 kilometers that way. Yep. And then just so we don't get any trouble when I'm running, I'm going to have the uh, end time be really big just so I don't hit it. So there, now child is initialized. And it's uh, the input folder is just like the child input file, just as one input file. And then uh, we just do the same commands as we did before. We initialize child. Now it's ready to go. We're going to run child for 10 time steps. Now we're ending up, we've ended up at 100 years. And as before, we could, we could update child to 200 years. So we'd be updated until now. So again, you know how to run one model, you know how to run them all. So now we're going to uh, play around. So Greg was talking about playing with models. So now we're going to play with this child model that we've, that we've created. So we're going to look at some child output variables. Actually, I'm going to do this. So I have to keep that in mind. So child.outputvars. So these are the output variables for child. There aren't uh, too many, so that makes it easy to work with. Uh, but we're going to concentrate on land's uh, surface elevation. So we can get information about that variable. So the nice thing about the BMI is that it's self-describing. So you'll see that if I do child, uh, then dot var, we're going to get some information about land surface elevation. So land surface elevation, so it, it's uh, an array of n nodes long. It's uh, defined at the nodes of the grid. It's an input and output variable. And has units of meters, and it's on grid zero. So a, ch <clears throat> a model has a solution grid; it can have multiple ones, and a variable is defined on the grid on each of the grids. So in this case, land land surface elevation is defined on grid zero. We can get some information about that if we'd like to. Um, so it's an X-ray data set. Um, this is in the more or less in the U-grid format, so it's a standard format for describing the topology of a grid. And let's have a let's let's plot it up just to see what it looks like. So we'll just do a, a land surface. And this is just to make the graph look a little prettier. Oh, it's not big enough. So that what I want to show here is that the child grid is an unstructured mesh. And we're going to couple it to said flux, which has uniform rectilinear mesh. Um, so there's a whole bunch of triangles there you may not be able to see, but the elevations are defined on the, the corners of the triangles. So it's what, what I just showed you, there was child is set uh, initialized with uh, flat topography with some random noise in it. So we want to, if we're going to couple this with said flux, we want 
some land and some ocean. So I'm going to change the, the elevations to include some topography and some bathymetry. So first we're gonna get the uh, X and Y's of child. And remember we're, at, we're looking for grid zero here. And uh, we're gonna get values of, uh, so we have the X's and Y's. And so we're gonna have a shoreline, let's do it at 10 kilometers. Shoreline's 10 kilometers, now we're gonna change the, uh, so if, if for Y less than the shoreline, we're gonna subtract 100 meters. And for Y, greater than equal to the shoreline. We're gonna add 100 meters. So that's our new, uh, the, our new uh, uh, land surface elevation grid. And so we have to do one more thing for child to see this. We have to do child.set value, uh, land surface elevation. And then, so the first argument here is the name of the variable we want to set, and the second one is going to be a NumPy array of values at the nodes. So then if we plot this up, we've just changed child's input uh, land surface elevations to be something that we can couple with two with plots. So we've got some land and we've got some ocean. So that's not something you could have done before. This is, uh, we're doing this dynamically. And let's, let's uh, we'll do child.update until we'll just update it for 5,000 years. And then I will show you. And so you can see child is starting to erode the landscape. But it's not doing anything in the ocean yet because that's not what child does. So, what we're going to do now, we're going to play around with a little bit. So we're going to add a, uh, an uplift component to child. And we're just going to do this dynamically here. So it's going to be a little bit of typing here. So bear with me. So we're going to uplift a block in the upper right corner of that grid you just saw. And I'm just going to show you how you might do that. And then we're going to advance it in time. So here we've got a time loop that goes from now, which is wherever we have child at, uh, and then 5,000 years in the future, taking steps of 100 years. So this is, this is basically how you could couple it to another, uh, another model. So we're gonna update it until this new time. We're gonna get, actually I'm just gonna copy this. We're gonna get the land surface elevations. And now we're gonna add some uplift. So if we're just, so as I said, it's gonna be a block in the upper right corner. So yeah. Oh yeah, sure, yeah, I'll do that in just a second here. Yep, that's as high as I think we can go. Uh, okay, and then set value. See, so what we've done here is, if you can see it, uh, we've updated child for one, one time step. We get the surface elevations, we change them, we adjust those elevations, and then we set the values, and then we just do that loop. Uh, until five, for another 5,000 years. So now we've added this block in the uh, upper right corner. And uh, we will update it for another 5,000 years. We'll erode into the block, see what happens. And 
that were up running it for another 5,000 years. And then so we've eroded into the block. It's not coming out very well in the, in the graph there. Oh, that's because I've up, you know, see that's what I get for doing this. So I multiply by a thousand instead of a hundred right there. But you get the idea, you can uplift the block then you erode into it. We're doing this all dynamically. And just about out of time. So I'm gonna take you over to how we might couple child and said flux. And so most of this, I've written, there's a lot of here, so I've written it all out for you. Most of it is very similar to what you've seen already. So if we're gonna couple the two models together, we're gonna to instantiate child and then said flux. We're gonna run the setup method for both of them so that they set up their model runs in different folders. And we're gonna initialize them. Now we're gonna do something just a little bit different. We're going to set the child's elevations to include a little bit of land and a little bit of water. And we're going to set the elevations in child. But now we want to make sure that Sedflux gets, those same, gets that same input grid. So before, remember, we ran the set value. So I'm down on this line right now. So before we did a set value where the second argument was a NumPy array, just an array of values. But now we're going to say, okay, get your values from child for, from land surface elevation, map them from child's unstructured mesh to said flux's uniform rectilinear grid. And we do this using the ESMF mappers and then set the values in said flux. And then we could, uh, I'm right out of time here. So the final step would be to, for the time loop. So we'd run, so here, time steps of 10 years, we update child to the next time step. We set said fluxes, that we map the, well, that's essentially the bed load flux in child. So child's eroded land, sent it to the coastline. We're gonna take those values, map it to said flux, said flux will pick them up. And then we will update said flux to the next time step so that said flux will disperse that sediment into the ocean through surface plumes and well, they can be acted on by currents and things. And then we get values, and then we have to map, so because Sedflux has changed the elevations, we need to map those elevations back to child um, so that child will see this new delta that's, that's forming. And then we just do that over and over again. And I'm gonna show you a movie, if we have time, of what this might look like. So again, so, we, so the landscape evolution model is the top, seascape evolution model is the bottom, so that as we evolve in time, child's eroding into the landscape, delivering said flux to, set, to set, <laughs> sediment to said flux, which then uh, is building a delta that child runs over. And it really isn't too much harder than those lines of code that I showed you. Um, so you could, there's lots of different river mouths that child is, the main river mouth obviously is that big delta on the right hand side. So this is taking two very big complex models and coupling them in not too much uh, Python code. Um, and then, so that's it. So if there's any questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer, but we don't have too much time. Thank you. <laughs> Nicole. Yeah. yeah, you could definitely change them and uh, it's easy to do. Uh, you would do it in that setup set uh, step. So if I go back to, um, you know, so when I, when I did child, I, I did change these parameters, but you know, as you know, the child input file is very, very long. So there, there could be many parameters here that you could, anything's up for grabs. Uh, 
Uh, well, that's a good question. No, it doesn't have to have the update until. It certainly is recommended. In many models, it's not very difficult to add that. But what we would do if we say you had a, a model that ran just on yearly time steps, it couldn't run partial years. What we would do is run it for, and say you wanted to run it to year one and a half. We'd run it to year two and then linearly interpolate the values between year zero and one. But that's not an ideal solution. Um, it's computationally intensive and it's maybe, it doesn't give you the best results, so. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the, so yes, that's basically right. Uh, the landscape is being eroded by child and the, carry, the sediment is carried by child to the coastline where it stops and child passes those fluxes to set to said flux, which then sends it to a surface plume that's sent to the ocean. Between, so we do that with the, uh, let's see, I'll go back to here. So that is communicated in this step right here. In this step here, so this is so said flux is saying, child, give me your bed load fluxes, and the bed load fluxes here is actually a grid on child. So the bed load fluxes are defined at nodes on child's grid, and this says, okay, child, give me those and map them to my grid, said flux grid, and then said flux can deal with that. Given a a, a grid of bed load fluxes, said flux knows what to do. Sure, yeah. Yeah, so so one thing that, sorry, I'm cutting into your coffee break here. Um, so one very important part of this that I, I didn't mention is these standard names for each of the variables. And this is very important because you wanna make sure that you're coupling two models, the, the, the variables you're exchanging between uh, models are what you think they are. And, and so there's a very, so Scott can talk a lot more about this, but there, we, we use Scott CSMS standard names to define, so this is part of the BMI, I guess it's not, so if when a model becomes a BMI, we want their names to be in this format so that we can more easily couple two models together. Um, you'll notice that, so for the bed load flux, both child and said flux use that same name. So that makes it much easier. Notice up here though, it's a little bit different, um, child, has something called land surface elevation. Because when we wrapped child with a BMI, it was only run on land. So we said land surface elevation. So, but maybe this should now be in child with this new version of child, it should be, uh, Scott, what would it be like land or sea surface, sediment surface elevation or something along those lines to indicate that it could be both land and ocean. To, to get this? Oh, to change the standard names? Oh, it would take about two minutes. So it would be very simple, yeah. I probably should have done it for this, but this is a learning, uh, learning experience. The website, well, um, Scott might be better to answer that. I mean, if you go to our website for the CSMS standard names, we've got lots of stuff on that. And I think we have links to Scott's newest versions, I believe. Um, and on GitHub, we have also links to that. So I think it would be, so on GitHub it would be CSMS slash standard names, I think. So that's where that would be. Yeah, but for sure you could talk to me or go to the website and we'll, we'll get you hooked up. Right beside you.
uh, it's not very difficult. And I'm, we haven't found a name that couldn't be a standard name yet. 